I would like to introduce you to Anne Frank, the 80-year-old man whom you're looking at is most likely Anna Frank. As shocking as this might seem to you, our guest for today's interview, Mr. Ridley Felderer, a Swedish researcher, has unearthed massive evidence that Anne Frank was not a 13-year-old girl, did not most likely write the diary, but every indication seems to point a finger in the direction of this man, Otto Frank, her father. Here is the real Anna Frank, victim most likely of her father's greed, not of the German people. I'm Ernst Zundel, president of Samistad Publishers, and I'm going to act as the moderator somewhat today of this interview. I'm holding in my hand the book that Mr. Felderer wrote, and it was published in the United States by the Institute for Historical Review in Torrance, California. The book has become a runaway bestseller, has already seen several printings. There is a German edition, just about ready to be published, and also naturally a Swedish edition. The book is entitled Anne Frank's Diary, A Hoax, No Question Mark. In other words, it's a statement. Anne Frank's Diary, A Hoax by Dietlieb Felderer. Mr. Felderer, I welcome you onto our program. Naturally, Mr. Felderer is a Swedish citizen and is an internationally known researcher. He publishes a number of tracts of a religious nature. He's known as a Bible researcher and also does on-site research into historical and philosophical topics. He's a Swedish citizen who came to Sweden after the Second World War from a concentration camp in Europe under the Swedish Count Folk Bernadotte's humanitarian relief move to give new homes to 5,000 refugees, largely Jewish, in Sweden. He was educated in Stockholm and uh, wanted to become a lawyer, but instead turned to writing. His material has appeared around the world and uh, in magazines, for instance, such as Reader's Digest, he also circulates internationally, uh, sent forth newsletters in several languages, and the one that I am most familiar with, because I'm one of the recipients and subscribers to it, is called Jewish Information. I met Mr. Felderer two months ago in Sweden and uh, decided to interview him then. He is on a North American speaking tour, has just been a guest lecturer at the Institute for Historical Review Historians Conference, Revisionist Historians Conference in Chicago, and uh, he has consented to this interview. To my left is Mr. Eric Thompson, an American writer and intelligence analyst who has contributed material to various intelligence agencies of different countries, especially relating to the use of propaganda by such organizations as Zionists and Communists in the politics of the Western world because it is appreciated by men in government and especially the military that the role of propaganda today is a very powerful one and uh, I welcome you to our program and what I will do is I will hold back somewhat today and let Mr. Thompson who is far more qualified in this field than myself to kind of question you and I'd like it to be just a very free roaming discussion let's not get hung up on structure and method and so on I think that we should have a conversation about this diary of Anne Frank your reasons why you say it is a hoax, and uh, I will play devil's advocate piping in maybe at inopportune moments to ask questions that I think people out in the public generally would like to know about. I just want to mention that you are not the only author that has come to grips with this diary of Anne Frank, but that uh, Professor Forison from France, who is himself uh, an expert, a forensic expert really, in analyzing the content and also the age and the makeup of ancient texts. He is a kind of an archaeologist of literature and texts, if you want. Uh, he also has subjected the handwriting and the documents of uh, Mr. Frank here and the alleged originals I think he never was able to see. 
Uh, he also wrote a book about the topic and comes to quite a similar conclusion to your own. So it seems that this Anne Frank diary that has been translated into 53 languages has, as a spin-off industry, that's almost what it has become, an industry created immensely wealthy people such as uh, film producers and uh, the father himself lived in the lap of luxury in Switzerland and uh, I have heard that he himself apparently generated somewhat in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million dollars out of his take in the book. The spin-off of the book also has created what they call a foundation and uh, if I would just make a quote from your uh, Anne Frank Foundation folder here, the foundation regularly organizes exhibitions on topics which are related to the history of the house, oppression and persecution and discrimination. Examples of exhibitions held by the foundation include migrant workers and 2,000 years of anti-Semitism. Here too, guided tours are given to groups if requested, which means that the purpose of the Anne Frank diary was to become a propaganda vehicle, obviously. And the pro proceeds and the profits from this tearjerker are in effect used to further what seems to be purposes. I mean, what have migrant workers got to do with the fate of this girl in the Second World War? Uh, we are seeing here the clever, if unethical use of allegedly the tragic story of a young man, in, a young woman in wartime being exploited, it seems, by her father. Um, what led you to get interested? I mean, you are sweet, you are young, you are obviously having a life ahead uh, in uh, prosperous Sweden that can only be sabotaged or derailed uh, by tackling such a thing. I mean, we all know the power of the Zionist lobby. This is undoubtedly also considerable in Sweden. What on heck would make you uh, march in, you know, is it a matter of uh, fools marching in where, where angels fear to tread, or why did you get interested in the diary of Anne Frank? Uh, well, uh, the reason for that was that in uh, the early 1970s I started to get uh, great doubts about um, the Holocaust, or what uh, we know, now call the extermination theory. And so I started to investigate this theory more and more spe specifically about the gas chambers. Uh, at that time I had not made any visits to uh, Poland where most of the alleged sites of extermination took place. So I realized that uh, I, had to sp I could spend some time in the meantime before going there to study some other things. And seeing that the Anne Franks diary so important within the extermination theory it is very possible perhaps the most important uh, book that was it has been used to support this theory then i decided this book this diary deserves a real close study and i was determined to find out whether the story could be true or whether it was perhaps just a, a makeup now, I know there are many different editions. It has been published in 53 languages, but I know there is numerous English language editions even. And for instance, we have here the Diary of Anne Frank, which is a, a kind of a 20th edition in pan books. But you used for your research another company's book. Uh, well, I used uh, the uh, Cardinal edition, which is the edition uh, uh, published in USA. This uh, edition here is an edition which is distribu distributed in England and Europe. I see. Now, I are they markedly different? I mean, you looked at these two, what seems to be the there, difference? There are um, differences in, in, in the contents, but I think the main uh, points of interest in the difference is the foreword and the edition in the beginning and at the end, which uh, um, describes how genuine the book is, how authentic the book is, and tries to support it. Now, I understand that you actually did go to visit the Anne Frank House in Holland. Yes. And you looked at the exhibits there presented, but at that time not with the idea in mind of ever writing about it. No, I, at the time when uh, we, came, we went there, I had never dreamed that I later on should write a book about it. Now, 
Mr. Thompson, I understand that you first came across the controversy, the controversial aspect of the Anne Frank Diary by reading a kind of a historical condensation of the whole complex of the Holocaust by the English historic professor, uh, I think his name is Harwood Beral, yes. that published this widely translated and reprinted booklet, Did Six Million Really Die? You came across the first indications that kind of confirmed some of the suspicions which you had as an intelligence analyst years before that, and then decided to dig deeper into the Anne Frank diary. Have you and uh, Mr. Feller, before you met him, did you read his book before you met him? No, I did not, and I was quite interested when I came across a copy of his Anne Frank's diary a hoax uh, to see that he had brought all of the inconsistencies and contradictions together that were in the alleged diary. How would you evaluate his style, I mean, his method of going about dissecting the story from an intelligence analyst's point of view? It makes very entertaining reading, and at the same time it is uh, excellent uh, in its analytical techniques because it subjects the entire diary to a thorough cross-examination using very impeccable logic and uh, a very uh, far-ranging uh, knowledge of factual circumstances uh, which must have uh, been operative during the time. For example, uh, a door is a door and uh, when people forget that a door suddenly becomes a bookcase, uh, normal people would be very astounded to see this transformation. Apparently, in the diary, no one is astounded that uh, a door suddenly becomes a bookcase and that half a building, which is visible from all sides to the public, suddenly disappears uh, in the diary. As in a work of fantastic science fiction, half a house just disappears and no one is at all curious. Now, Mr. Felder, obviously you also found these uh, kind of inconsistencies troubling. Is that what finally led you to analyze this book kind of sentence by sentence, chapter by chapter, verse by verse? Or were it, was it external influences? I know that you had a vast correspondence with the father of Anna Frank, Otto Frank, and also with Meyer Levine, one of the script writers that produced a play. Uh, did you have that correspondence before you wrote the book, or after you wrote the book, or during the time that you wrote the book? Well, most of it was done uh, before I wrote the book, but some of the correspondence continued while I wrote the book. And as a matter of fact, it has continued up till now. So this is um, a research that continues in view of the fact that there are a lot of myster mysteries surrounding the diary which are still not uh, answered. Now, am I correct in saying and recollecting that Otto Frank actually was quite friendly towards you? He was uh, very friendly in the beginning and... Uh, Did you ever meet him? No, I never met him. We had our correspondence by means of mail. Unfortunately, um, he later on died, but by that time I had, of course, already published my, my book. I also found that, uh, as you perhaps uh, know, uh, Mr. Frank uh, denied me all further correspondence after he found out that I was not a hundred percent loyal to the story. In other words, he never really opened up his original documentation to you? No. Did he ever show you the actual sheets out of the diary, no. the pages or anything? No. I, I, I doubt whether anybody up to this date has really seen everything. Now, I understand you also corresponded with Professor Forison, who also wrote a book on this topic and who did meet Otto Frank. Was he ever able to see the actual pages himself? I think he was able to see a, a few pages, yes, but he was not allowed to study the contents. And this was also the reason why I felt that it was really hopeless for me to go to Switzerland where Mr. Frank was living, seeing that uh, my main purpose was actually to find the original documents and study it. And I realized that the father refused it, so I decided I better not go there. And uh, are you satisfied that just by reading the books 
the various books that are out on the Diary of Anne Frank in various forms, that the conclusions that you have come to are airtight, watertight, that they in effect hold true? Is, is it good enough? Without seeing the actual handwriting, can you really conclude a sweeping conclusion that would lead to a book title without a question mark that calls a book Anne Frank's Diary a hoax? Period. Uh, well, of course, with the uh, progress, progression of the research, uh, things can always be made better. But I must say here that the main arguments which I used in a book, they have been confirmed in almost every point since the publishing of this first edition. So you feel quite safe? You don't think that there's going to be a hundred million dollar lawsuit breathing down your neck or after we are through with this pro uh, program, my neck? <laughs> well, uh, no, I perhaps could mention here that uh, the father did try and get the Swedish government to sue me, but uh, it didn't turn out that uh, the government was willing to do so. Did the government look at any of this material? Yes, they read through the entire book. Which department of the government of Sweden? It's the, our cha ca Chancellor of Justice, and they are and in the charge Minister of, of Justice, yes. yes. Like the Attorney General would be in Canada? They are in yes. charge of uh, um, publishing rights and so forth. Now, what kind of report, to your knowledge, should they send back to Otto Frank? You know, they looked at your writings, they looked at the book, The Diary of Anne Frank, and what was their verdict? You're obviously out of jail, you're not in the <laughs> Swedish jail. Uh, no. What did they say? Well, the entire verdict is found in our newsletter number 122, two, where we have the entire um, verdict of the uh, uh, Chancellor. And um, he says, if I sh can be briefly here, that uh, the way to do, go about this matter is not to um, uh, try and for, prohibit me from writing it, but to show uh, that uh, in my writing I'm wrong here and perhaps there. In other words, attack me in what I'm writing and not so prohibit my research. Undoubtedly, you as an, intel an intelligence analyst of propaganda, this is really the only way in democracies that we have to defeat a kind of uh, subversive propaganda yes by exposing it to public yes. scrutiny, ridicule right. if necessary, and uh, legal action yes. in this case if Otto Frank in effect had had elected to stand yes. us. Isn't that but the method? Above all, to expose a controversial issue to open discussion so that everyone is entitled to all the facts that can be made available and at the same time everyone is entitled to use their own mind to decide for themselves whether uh, one side is true, the other is false, or whether the truth is perhaps someplace else. But you see, the argument that is advanced by the proponents of the Holocaust or the exterminationist theory using Anne Frank as a vehicle for their message that uh, you and you and I suppose me, by wanting to discuss this sacred cow, uh, are in effect uh, trying to rewrite history, and we yes. are the unimprovable reactionary yes. Nazis. Yes. Basically, we are being accused of blasphemy. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's our inquiries uh, are actually putting uh, uh, committing a sacrilege against uh, the sacred cow of the Holocaust legend, which leads me to ask you, Mr. Felder, um, having read the diary for myself, and uh, uh, it's a rather boring book. I didn't enjoy reading it, as I have other books, and I discovered that it, it seemed to require a great deal of editing because the story had trouble matching and fitting together. Uh, it didn't really seem to be much of a diary because diaries are supposedly uh, consistent and factual, and uh, this seemed to be full of contradictions from one day to the next. Uh, I just wanted to possibly restate, as you have said, the alleged diary of Anne Frank is one of the main stories which supports the Holocaust or extermination legend, and it is in, it is in use in many schools as required reading um, in the so-called uh, genocide issue. Yet, you were the first, to my knowledge, who has written 
such a concise and thoroughgoing analysis of this, this book, uh, why has no other author or researcher pointed out the obvious flaws, impossibilities, and inconsistencies? Because after all, the book is a very important uh, document to substantiate uh, the mass murder story that uh, the six million question and the exterminationist legend uh, consists of. Mm. Well, I think there are many reasons for that. Uh, I can maybe mention a few. One thing you just mentioned, and that is that uh, it is a very boring book. It's extremely boring to plow through it. And uh, when a bo book is boring, it becomes rather difficult for people to concentrate on the issue. Um, it's a long winding story and I think most people are just happy to get through with it if they have been required to read it. Then the other point is of course the general hypnotism which surrounds this very issue. One is not allowed to criticize it and um, well one is simply supposed to uh, accept it yeah, no matter how absurd the story is. There's it, another one too mm -hmm. which perhaps I, I should mention and we've just gone into that and that is the lawsuit which uh, Mr. Frank constantly threatened anybody who would mm -hmm. investigate the book. Actually, I don't know if you two gentlemen are aware that there was indeed a German school teacher who wrote already in the early 60s about the diary being most likely a fraud mm -hmm. And uh, Otto Frank uh, immediately pounced on him with a Hamburg law firm, and uh, the case did go to court, and uh, it was inconclusively settled out of court based on the handwriting expert, Mina Becker, I think was her name, who said at the time that, uh, oh no, that the material that she had seen would tend to indicate that the entire diary was written in the same handwriting and therefore is authentic. Mm. Now, there was a court case two years ago in Germany by an acquaintance of mine, Ernst Römer, in Hamburg, and his attorney, Rieger, who is a young man like we are of the new generation, he managed to get the West German government's uh, criminal experts involved and uh, they did forensic studies actually in Basel and uh, came down very heavily in favor of Römer and uh, Römer in effect uh, it is stated that the German government says many additions were made to the diary that came out in this court case in ballpoint pen. Now since ballpoint pen came only into popular use in the early 50s if Mina Becker's claim is correct that the entire manuscript was in the same handwriting by the same person, then that same person must have been alive uh, yes. uh, in 1951-52 using ballpoint pen, which Anne Frank, the little refugee girl hiding in this house in, in the back alleys of uh, Amsterdam, certainly couldn't have laid her hands on. And uh, rather than condemning the school teacher's case, it, it, uh, it proves that whoever concocted the diary in effect, using the same handwriting, was alive in 1951. Mm. So Anne did not die in a concentration camp. And if she didn't die, then when did she die? Mm. Or if she indeed did die, who wrote the diary? Who, who was it? I think that's the point. And now let's dissect the actual things which leads us to think that Mr. Felder is on to one of the greatest literary frauds in uh, certainly this century. Mm, yes. And uh, as I may point out, that uh, literary fraud is uh, no light matter. It is a criminal offense in most civilized countries. And uh, Switzerland, for instance, came down very heavily on an American writer called Clifford Irving, who had claimed that he wrote a biography of uh, Howard Hughes yes. at the time, and uh, for his fraud served over two years in a Swiss jail and was heavily fined and the profits of the book were taken away from him. So if what you gentlemen and what Robert Forrestan and Harwood Veral are saying is true, then I think uh, we ought to pursue towards the end of this program yes. the point that how do we institute legal action against the heirs of uh, Otto Frank or the foundation for recovering some of the money at least. Mm -hmm. um, 
You had some questions there for Mr. Felderer. Yes, I did. Uh, based on my reading, both of the, the diary, uh, which is, uh, well, in its various editions, only one of which I bothered to read in English, the um, Anne Frank's diary, a hoax, you mention one of the first problems of determining the actual size of the alleged diary. Now, it would seem obvious to me that if a person has written a diary, it is a diary as we think of it. It's in a, a little book, uh, possibly with a locked cover. Uh, it may consist of uh, two books, but it has a finite um, dimension. Were you ever able to prove or find out just how big or how small the Anne Frank diary actually is? Uh, well, the, the way I went about it, seeing that I had not access to the files that Mr. Frank kept in the, supposedly kept in a bank vault, the only way I could do was to check photographs in various newspapers where Mr. Frank would appear with an alleged diary. And for instance, we have just this picture here, which I, uh, appear in a Swedish newspaper, and uh, then compare this picture with other pictures which I could see in uh, various advertisements of the Anne Frank House um, and perhaps uh, books uh, pertaining to the Anne Frank and by doing so and by, by comparing for instance the foreword in the Cardinal edition one uh, noticed that uh, there were discrepancy mm -hmm. this was not the same book the books at were different. One talked about a checkered book, a very tiny checkered book. We have this particularly large, book. large books with uh, not rounded corners, the cover and so forth. And so I could see that um, we, must have, we must have several books which all pertain to be the authentic uh, diary of Anne Now, Anne didn't Frank. some people involved in the story who lived in the building describe these books, how they looked, that they were with a checkered cover on it, and as you say, had rounded corners. And now we see in this Swedish photograph, what he's supposed to purport is holding in his hand, has square corners, and uh, is certainly a substantial book, mm -hmm. I would estimate with some four or five hundred pages. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's certainly not a, a schoolgirl's mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So th th already there is kind yeah. of pictorial evidence that there must have been yes. numerous books mm -hmm. Certainly the one he's holding here yes. is more like a company's ledger book yes. and not like a child's school book. Yes. Uh, just to possibly underline what this would mean to the, uh, in a forensic study, if you had reported that you had seen a car, but you could not tell what color the car was, you couldn't tell how many wheels it had, or whether in fact yeah. it was a truck or not, uh, your testimony would be thrown right out of court. And uh, Mr. Frank apparently cannot describe with any degree of consistency what his daughter's diary actually look like, looks like or how long it is or, in fact, what kind of book it occupies. Now, Mr. Felder, let's go to the actual handwriting. We have established that there must be all kinds of books. Perhaps I should mention here, when seeing that you say so, a, a particular Swedish case which uh, I was very much surprised about, and that is the uh, translator of the Swedish edition of the mm -hmm. Anne Frank diary uh, was uh, told by Mr. Frank, this is what this woman told to me herself, that it was absolutely imperative that she should translate it from the Dutch version. Now obviously seeing that uh, it is alleged that the German translation is identical to the Dutch version, I started to wonder why it was she couldn't translate it from the German version. Uh, an even more astounding fact was that uh, although Mr. Frank uh, had insisted on that it should be translated from the Dutch version, this uh, translator didn't know any Dutch. And uh, so she had to translate it after all from the German version. But in our um, edition of the Swedish public, public publication, it actually says it was translated from the Dutch version, which it was not. So already an inconsistency yes, there. Yes. Now, am I not correct that the woman who translated 
or okayed or at least proofread and made refinements of the original German translation, uh, took sex passages out of the diary, kind of semi-pornographic passages almost, because she said that the German reading audience would be shocked and offended how a young girl like Anne Frank could be so mature in her sex life, in effect. Is that true? Uh, yes, they were a lesion of that nature. And Mr. Frank has repeatedly said that uh, the only things that uh, were taken away were, were portion of advanced sex, which the girl is supposed to have been indulged in. Personally, I do not know of any other book um, uh, of this nature. I believe this is the first child pornographic work that has ever been published, as, as far a, as I know. As a school textbook? Yes. Now, uh, you have more questions there, I see, that you have lined up for Mr. Felder. Well, um, being a, sort of an agent for the audience here and hoping that uh, I'm doing a good job for them and asking questions they might have, um, you mentioned uh, in this book of yours that there were differences between the translations. In other words, these were not actually translations, they were actually separate books alleging to be the diary of Anne Frank. Yes, correct, and I was just telling to you the case of the Swedish translator here, which uh, translated it from the German and not from the Dutch version. Uh, Robert Forisson has done an excellent work in uh, comparing the various editions, and the study of his uh, writing indicates that um, portions are completely different. They, they contradict each other. Uh, we have the French version, German version, the, 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 um, the Dutch version, and as a matter of fact, there's even two different editions, or at least two different editions of the German uh, version, and they, they do not read the same either. Now, what are we seeing here? Are we seeing that the translators were given such liberties by Otto Frank to, in effect, write 15 Anne Frank diaries, uh, because, after all, if large portions of it don't correspond, I always understood it, and I have done translation work myself, that, uh, number one, you can be sued in a court of law for, for purporting to have a translation of something that yes. is rather important, yes. and then it turns out it's creative writing. Yes. And uh, it certainly is unethical, yes. number two, to state that you have a translation of the original. Yes. Uh, what could the possible reason be that these people would rewrite the book? S certainly sections of this book. Well, uh, I think there was the general mishmash that uh, seems to be behind Mr. Frank's work. He doesn't seem to be a man who can particularly concentrate to think ahead of time. He probably thought he would get away with this thing. People would forget about the older edition. There wouldn't be any talks about it. And uh, I suppose he was rather surprised that finally somebody did really start to look into it. Wouldn't it indicate, though, that the book really is being handled or managed by somebody behind the yes. scenes, in effect, as a vehicle? And uh, as we do in advertising, which is my line of business, we tailor-make ads to a specific targeting group. For instance, uh, I know that in Ebony magazine, some of the, uh, the, the kind of hairdressing people uh, they are selling hair straighteners yes. or face yes. skin lighteners and so yes. on. Whereas uh, amongst the white people in uh, white men's magazines, we are selling suntan cream. Yes. And are we seeing something like this here, that the book is being really tailor-made and targeted for a specific well, audience? If, if I can make a statement here, I would say that it's uh, even more serious than that, because a diary is a very specific form of writing. Uh, it's similar to uh, newspaper report which purports to be a factual report. We had one case recently where the, uh, a black woman won a Pulitzer Prize under false circumstances mm -hmm. in which she invented a story and uh, said that it was a news story. Now this is supposed to be a diary, yet we discover that from one translation to another, certain parts of the diary are, are omitted without giving any notice to the reader that these parts are omitted. Um, again, we see that 
in the translation, it's not simply the normal allowance we must make for different languages. Um, however, these are, these are just bad translations. Uh, in one case, uh, I might point out, uh, a chair becomes uh, um, a chase lounge, or uh, things change. Uh, from one translation to another. Actual objects change, yes. which will create a totally different setting yes. and picture. Did you not say that a book, a, a door became a bookcase? Or, or how is this? Uh, well, yes, this is the, a major part in the legend of the Anne Frank diary, and that is that uh, um, in order to keep the place secret, one uh, um, made a door into a moving bookcase. Hmm. In other words, uh, behind this door, um, seeing that it was a bookcase, people didn't, uh, the, the allegation is made, people wouldn't think anybody was living there because there was no door there, there was just a bookcase. Now, I can relate to that. I know that in Germany, when the Soviets came in to invade Germany, that many fathers or husbands in effect, did create false fronts and rooms and stuff like yes. that to hide their wives or girls yes. behind. Uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, why do you think that this would be such a crime, or is that at, uh, in a story at, at different places? Uh, why is it so significant to the story? Well, it's very significant to the story for Mr. Frank because, of course, he has to create an atmosphere that uh, they were living under the most terrifying conditions and utter secrecy um, there but there are many many problems involved here one is the fact that uh, during the time they were hiding this um, place was in use by the people who had worked there and some of them had worked there for a lengthy time and so of course uh, making a door like that would immediately uh, arise suspicion on the workers they no, would wonder what had happened to half of the building. In, in other words, uh, they would go up the stairs, let's say, or arrive in front of this door where they had gone through maybe a thousand times yeah. and find the, their door barred by a bookcase. Yes, and there are other places in the book which is rather hilarious. Now, does that, uh, Otto Frank explain to whom the books belong in the bookcase, or did the owner of the house put the books there? Did he collaborate with Otto Frank, or did he explain to the workers? That, oh, well, as of tomorrow, there's going to be a bookcase there? No, no, no. He kept it secret for everybody, and even the person who apparently, uh, later on in the book, we read how the, he, he was, the f former owner was going to sell the, uh, the building, and uh, it mentions a portion there in the diary how they come and notice the bookcase, but nobody uh, thinks about the, the thing that the new, new owner even bothers to find out uh, what he's actually buying. In other words, the new owner was laying down money for an entire building, but he was only getting half of it. Yes. And uh, the workers who had been using the entire building suddenly were not suspicious at all that uh, they couldn't get to the other part of the building any longer. <laughs> no. uh, which leads me in, into my question. The architecture of this, the so-called Anne Frank House seems to be uh, absolutely paramount to the the understanding of the diary. Um, how is the placement, the location of the house in relation to other houses, and the design of the house important to the diary? Well, the design of the house is very, very important on account of the secret theory which this um, diary has. In other words, nobody is supposed to have known about the, uh, the family and the friends being hidden there. Now obviously, if this building, for instance, had many, many windows going out in various directions, and there were other houses close by, the question arises, why is it that the family who lived there for a couple of years um, were not seen by the neighbors? Why were not the lights seen at night? Why was not the smoke seen when the chimney was um, was full, blasting full. Now, Mr. Felder, you also mentioned a vacuum cleaner, that these people were even using a vacuum cleaner to clean the place. 
Now, I took the liberty to obtain a 50-year-old vacuum cleaner, which would be about the model used by the Frank family when they were cleaning up the house. While the workers were working there, or when did they do their cleaning? Uh, they did the cleaning in the middle of the day when the workers were there. Now, I would like to ask our cameraman to turn on the vacuum cleaner so our audience... You see, it, it's so noisy that you can't even hear me talk. No, no. Now, no. I, I know from, uh, from uh, my own childhood that World War II model vacuum cleaners were horrendously noisy. Mm. And certainly not everybody had a vacuum cleaner, that a noise like that suddenly going on would certainly create all kinds yes. of questions and suspicions. Yes. Well, tests have been made with our modern, modern vacuum cleaners in Sweden just recently, and they show a decibel far above uh, many industrial machines. So the, the noise from the vacuum cleaner is just horrendous. And then the fact also that in some editions of the Anne Frank Diary, it mentions, mentions the use of the vacuum cleaner in other instances. Mm -hmm. Now, also, what has always intrigued me on the story is that wartime rationing was in effect. Mm -hmm. And having lived through Europe in wartime conditions with the rationing in place during the war and after the war, I can assure you that we had nothing to spare for anybody else. Not, I mean, we were five children and uh, there was barely enough for the five of us, yet somebody there, uh, when I read the diary, had a very well-stocked larder with food. How did they obtain the food that they ate? Well, uh, the, uh, the diary makes it out as if they obtained the food through friends. Friends, in other words, they were friends of Mr. Frank and all the people living there with him, uh, brought this food continuously. And it's also rather amusing to read that the food was apparently received free from Dutch people. And this uh, food would be stored in the attic and other places of the mm -hmm. house. The diary, as a matter of fact, was in and describes even how much food they had. I, the I, I remember vaguely something about 200 cans of peas at one time. Yes, and there was meat and there was all kinds of food they had. In, they were affluently living in that. I mean, I have some Dutch friends who still are sore at the Germans for their strict rationing. Mm. As a matter of fact, claims have been made that the Germans deliberately starved the Dutch population. And uh, I know of one medical study uh, into women who were pregnant during that time after the war to find out what the effect had been of the semi-starvation diet of the Dutch pregnant women during this period. And yet uh, the Frank family never seems to have suffered. Now, isn't there also a question of a green grocer who was supplying uh, groceries to the Anne Frank family yes. who lived very close by and used to deliver it? Yes, and delivered it free. Didn't, didn't have to pay anything for it. To now, the people in hiding? Yes. Now this green grocer, just, let's just imagine, here is a fellow with a basket of salad makings. Uh, when would he arrive to do this delivery? In the middle of the night? Possibly breaking curfew? Yeah, or, that's a very or good question. during the day when all the workers uh, were there and suddenly mm -hmm. this man appears on the premises and he's wandering around with this basket of mm -hmm. uh, entering the of parts of suddenly, the house behind the yes, bookcase. Suddenly disappears behind a bookcase. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't this attract suspicion? Oh, we certainly um, And again, it's, it, there's another amusing part where they actually mention about uh, a dental drill being yes. brought into the, the house. Yes. I mean, one certainly wonders. Uh, they knew that the house, house Houses were raided and uh, uh, um, searched for contraband. And so one certainly wonders what the uh, raiders would have thought if they saw in a, in a house which is supposed to be a house, a building where um, spices were stored, yes. they suddenly find a dental drill. Yes. Now, I was astonished in reading the diary that they, the family was, in effect, listening to the BBC London. They had a radio. Yes that they were listening to, to yes. serious music. With, without earphones. Yeah, yes. that, that, I mean, the radio was on, and uh, it apparently was a very powerful radio because it was able to pick up the BBC. Yes, and, uh, and uh, they, they were listening to everything except German, because German was apparently not a civilized language, according to the, to the diary. And this is astounding, all these noises we hear, the vacuum cleaner, uh, dental drills, the, the, the shoutings. And yet we are told in the diary at the very beginning that uh, they were not 
even allowed to cough yes. because of the noise would carry to yes. the next building. And, and not only that, but the actual photographs of the building show that it's, you can walk around it virtually. Uh, there's no secret to the building. No. Uh, it can be seen from all sides. People live all around it, and it has windows on all sides, so you can virtually see through it. Now, one of the inconsistencies in the diary which I saw was that they had blackout curtains. So suddenly, uh, a building which is uh, supposedly unoccupied during the night uh, suddenly has blackout curtains put on it. No one can see through it. Good and yet, at the same time, uh, the writer of this diary claims that the moonlight reveals very clearly. Uh, so if the blackout curtains were in place, the moonlight couldn't get through. Mm. Um, and if the moonlight is getting through, the blackout curtains yeah. couldn't <laughs> have been in place. Mm. So here is another one of these absurd contradictions. But the point that I would like to make is that in the neighborhood during wartime where saboteurs are suspected and things like this, not one of the many neighbors would be at all suspicious about the strange alterations going on to this house. Um, this, uh, I mean, yeah, nobody, if nobody knew, then it could also have been a kind of a, a secret Nazi factory, exactly. if you want to, or a communist factory, sure, certainly. or a, a Dutch fascist place. Certainly. And uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, in Germany, the whole populace was constantly kind of asked by the government to report any strange doings and stuff like this, because pilots would have been shot down, yes, would be yes. hiding and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, people could earn extra food rations by finding Certainly. something like that. Now, isn't there also a case of um, library books being uh, taken out of the library or something? Did, or am I yes, mistaken? Yes, they borrowed, they borrowed uh, uh, library. I mean, they borrowed books at the library. Uh, but I think uh, another thing which is even more peculiar is the fact that they took uh, uh, courses to, uh, at the school and in, uh, in under the same name and yet ha being differently advanced yes. and they uh, received mail yes. also, well, the diary says. You, I mean, this is incredible. Well, you, you would say then that the none of the behavior which is of the people who were supposedly in hiding are actually uh, relevant to hiding. They contradict yeah, no. the whole thing because one, they're making noise. Two, they seem to be quite visible. And uh, three, their their routine is uh, obviously known to the neighbors around. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they're even registered at a local correspondence. Yes. yes. And they have visitors. Yes. yes. And they have a greengrocer bringing yes. grocery. And they have a dentist come to drill yes. the teeth. They have visitors, she and has overnighting, visitors, overnighting, yeah. overnighting and she has a boyfriend, mm. and has a boyfriend. The, my book, uh, the, the diary mentioned about uh, chopping of wood. Uh, yes, oh. carpentry work. Carpentry yes. work, yeah. acrobatic work. Yes, jumping about around in other jumping words. Jumping yeah. around and how the... Arguments how, and shouting matches. Yes, and how one of the members continuously uh, go around the house and so forth. Now, let me be devil's advocate here for a minute. Could it be that uh, you read this cardinal edition and that this is maybe an unauthorized edition? Uh, no, no, the edition is uh, authorized by Mr. Frank. And as a matter of fact, uh, the cardinal edition is the edition which has, where the diary was sold in mo most, in the greatest number. I see. The, the American edition is the largest number of or books where the diary in which you the know diary not sold. not being an uh, an expert in texts or an intelligence mm -hmm. analyst just the guy with common sense what gets to me is i have to go through i mean just mountains of red tape of plans drawn up by draftsmen and architects if i want to put a garage under my building mm -hmm. the slightest alteration has to be registered yes. now this is in canada yes. with the city hall right for instance uh, I had to change the entrance to my building uh, fr at the front. And what I had to do is submit, not, I had to submit my original yes. plans, and when they were changed only slightly, had to resubmit yes. for approval and for record keeping these plans with the city hall. Now, well, I know something about the Dutch. 
they are at least as bad as the yes. Canadians, if not like typical Europeans, where you can breathe without yeah. needing a government well, farm. Uh, even more, uh, even more important, uh, the inspection of, of factory premises in time of war uh, for fire prevention. Right. The uh, fire inspectors would, of course, know how big the building was because they could see it, and Every they entrance. would certainly wonder why they couldn't find out what was being stored right. in a full half of the building. Uh, furthermore, we hear about all this tobacco smoking going on in a spice warehouse, which is uh, very destructive to the spices. So uh, you would really be putting the spice warehouse out of business by uh, polluting it with all this tobacco smoke. Mm -hmm. So again, we see the impossibilities of, of uh, no. this book. In summation, then, could we say this, that here we have a family if we believe the diary, where a 13-year-old girl already writes about the German language being a non-civilized language. Mm -hmm. She talks about a sex life which really only most adults experience. They take all these courses. What we are really seeing spread before us seems to be people living a fairly normal life under fairly normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. That. They shout at one another when they get angry with one another. They laugh at one another. They have guests in. She has a boyfriend in. They want to make love. They, you know, they jump around with the acrobatics, as you say. They do carpentry work. The woman cleans the house with a powerful vacuum cleaner. They listen to BBC London. All this is not the kind of behavior of somebody who is hiding. No, they must so, have washed their clothes. So right. Yeah, so so what, what the diary really reports is the life, most likely, of a fairly well-to-do Jewish family mm -hmm. in the heart of Amsterdam mm -hmm. during yes. wartime Europe. Well, they were exceedingly well off, as I told Mr. Felder beforehand. Uh, in the United States, people with vacuum cleaners, especially during the war, were considered quite well to do. Yeah. And uh, most people didn't uh, really purchase vacuum cleaners until the mid-50s. So let's look at it this way. We have that they have lived basically really a normal life. Well, uh, I think uh, a luxurious life. Yes. Well, okay, matter, let's say uh, a normally luxurious for, for, life. For wartime. Uh, for wartime. I think most people... Uh, but what it gets to me is, as a German, you know, I've always kind of resented the image that the Germans had of being a bunch of slide rule, fanatically perfect, uh, super diligent, uh, aggressive investigators, and pursuers and infringers of other people's civil rights and human rights, and yet these same Gestapo people, which undoubtedly were all over Amsterdam, if one reads these accounts of the mm -hmm. war, uh, they were so uh, derelict in their duty. That, I mean, that, you know, they would be shot if, 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 if anything yes. like that would happen in their jurisdiction, and yet it seems they didn't know that, and this was obviously not the only case. No. I mean, can one believe this? Were the Germans such bungling idiots in the Second World War? What's, uh, I mean, uh, how could they run Europe like clockwork and make every extermination train run on time yes. and yet overlook this? Mm. Well, it certainly shows that the story is, uh, and if in, ma in, ma in many of its parts, for instance, the parts with the moving bookcase and all this and that, it's absolutely impossible to um, to harmonize with the rest of the story. Now, we are coming to an end. I, I, the one thing that we haven't discussed is Meyer Levine's involvement with the father. Now, you had correspondence with him. Now, Meyer Levine is a Jew, we know, a well-known Jew. Uh, the father commissioned him to write a play? Uh, yes, uh, he did. The father commissioned Meyer Levine, who is a rightist, uh, to uh, make, make prepare a play on the diary, which... So he uh, presumably did not know how politically motivated or inclined Marley Levine would be? Uh, that is possible also, but uh, the, the, there is a Stalinist um, sort of um, love. Uh, the, Mr. Frank has a sort of a Stalinist, out, Stal Stalinist outlook of politics and Mayor Levine had a rightist outlook, outlook, and they, these two came into a collision course. That means that, excuse me, that apparently 
the Otto Frank did never allow the Meyer Levine play to be played for that reason? No, no. He, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Frank even informed Meyer Levine that if his play would be played, then he would be sued. Do you suppose that uh, Meyer Levine, his play, could have revealed some damaging truths about the diary of Anne Frank? Yes, there were certain portions in the edition, in Mayor Levine's work which uh, Mr. Frank and his friends felt were not appropriate. And so Mr. Frank gave the job over to, to Goodrich and Hackett. Yeah. So in other words, we are seeing already the manipulation of the tragedy of a young girl in World War II being exploited long after the war with ever new generations for profit and for very sinister purposes. Thank you for joining me in this kind of macabre thing, but I appreciate you being here. If we are to believe what is written in the Anne Frank book, we would see the entrance, the secret entrance to the secret annex here concealed by a movable bookcase. Here is the movable bookcase. It contains file folders popular in Europe. Above it is the map. Now, on the right hand side we see that bookcase turned over to reveal the stairs behind it in the door. You can just barely see the spines of these file folders here. That is the thickness of the fake door. Here is the stair leading up to the area where the Frank family supposedly hid out all this time. Now if we examine the bookcase closely we will see that the wood is made of wooden planks at least three quarters of an inch thick. If you look at this here and you see it here in close up. Very sturdily built. Now that secret bookcase, that door with all the hinges, the carpentry work had to be done in secret. All the hammering, all the nailing, nobody supposedly realized that here is something that went on. Also the employees of, these, uh, of this office where they had the spices, for years they would have come up these stairs and gone up further into the annex. Suddenly they got a bookcase there and we are asked to believe that nobody of all these employees asked any questions and was in the least curious. The same thing must be asked of the man who bought the building. He never looked at the plans, it seems, never realized that he had far more space in this house which he bought than uh, he actually was allowed to see. Here are now a few of the Prinzengracht Canal which is the canal that the Anne Frank office building looked down on. And it's interesting, this canal is one of the busiest canals in all of Holland and certainly all of Amsterdam. And yet these huge windows, windows which Anne talked about having looked out of these windows, seeing over seeing vast areas of Amsterdam, marveling at the clear blue sky and at the sunshine would certainly think that one could see a girl standing in those windows. One should think that. And yet, in all the years that they hid there, apparently nobody saw her. Here now an aerial view of the building at 263 Prinzengracht, a picturesque building typical of the old Amsterdam. It is surrounded by the buildings of the same type, visible from everywhere, especially from the tower of the West Kirk Church. Picture number one, in the, in the picture, S number one, the West Kirk Church. Number two, the Anne Frank home, as it is today. Three, house number 265, the annex with the black roof. Number four, house number 263 with annex with red roof the Anne Frank house, five, house number 261 with a long red roof without an annex. Note how the houses of the neighborhood crowd around the Anne Frank house and its annex were exposed from all directions regardless of the trees. 
Here, a map, a road map of the core of Amsterdam as it was in 1943-44. You can clearly see what a busy place in the core of this very busy metropolis 263 Prinzengracht Street really was. Here now is the room where Anne Frank slept. And it is very clearly visible that the window opens out into the courtyard like many European windows. Now that means that at any time when she talks in her book that the window was open, that she could see blue skies and the fresh air coming in and so on, somebody from across the street or across the house, very clearly visible at a very short distance away, could certainly see this young girl in broad daylight because she could not look out since we know from her own story that the windows were covered with cloth against air raids and so on. In other words, she had to open the window to look out and therefore somebody could equally as well look in. So I think one can safely assume that we once again have exposed one of the lies. The handwriting of Anne Frank is very interesting in that she must be the only person in the whole world that regressed from a mature handwriting to a child like handwriting. The top handwriting is allegedly from the 12th June 1942, the bottom one from the 10th October 1942. And yet the top one is of a very much more mature person than the childlike handwriting on the bottom. Now it is interesting that German forensic experts of the forensic lab of the Bundeskriminalamt, which is like the German FBI, examined the handwriting and the paper and the ink of Anne Frank's as allegedly the diary was made up from and we want to examine those documents now as the next sequence. Here is the West German forensic section of the Bundeskriminalamt which is tantamount to the German FBI. Document number K T41-2404, diagonal-79, dash stamped 11th June 1980, Attorney J. Rieger. The document is dated the 28th of May 1980, in other words, that is when the examination of the diary of Anne Frank had taken place by these police experts. They went to Switzerland in examined diary number one, diary number two, diary number three, and 312 loose sheets of papers comprising a collection, a manuscript collection, it says here. And what they found out was very simply this, that the diary was written in many parts in ballpoint pen. Now, ballpoint pen, interestingly enough, did not become popularly available until 1950-1951. Yet, the manuscript collection, the loose sheets, for instance, were already dated the 20th of June 1942. Diary number one was dated 12th June 1942. Diary number two was dated 22nd of December 1943 to 17th of April 1944. And diary number three was dated from the 17th of April 1944 to the 1st of August 1944. Therefore, the girl, if she wrote it, couldn't have written it in ballpoint pen. We also have a handwriting analysis by a German court-approved graphical analyst and uh, Mina Becker was her name from Hamburg, and she had determined already in 1960 that the handwriting of all the manuscripts and the diaries were the same, one in the same person had in effect written the diary of Anne Frank. So if it was written in ballpoint pen, as the Bundeskriminalamt found out, then it certainly cannot have been written by one in the same person if Anne Frank died, as is alleged, 
in a German concentration camp while the Nazis were still running Germany because after all the Nazi government was defeated in 1945, 8th of May, not in 1951.